Hello and welcome to the Take 15 podcast from CFA Institute. I'm Lauren Foster, and this is the show where we bring you an unbiased lens on investing and capital markets through short conversations with some of the world's most interesting and accomplished people. Today on the show, Troy Prince, founder and CEO of Wall Street Bound, a nonprofit that is focused on creating pathways of success for urban youth through careers in finance. Troy sat down with guest host Bob Stammers, a CFA charter holder and longtime advocate for investor education. Bob has written for Fortune and Enterprising Investor on a range of personal finance topics, including retirement, and is a longtime contributor to CFA Institute's Future of Finance initiative. Their conversation spans the current state of diversity and inclusion within the investment industry, how urban youth should approach finding jobs within the industry, and how firms can find talent from this under-recruited section of the potential employee pool. I hope you enjoy their conversation. Troy Prince, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. So can you give our audience a bit of a background about yourself and Wall Street Bound and provide some insight into what you were hoping to achieve when you started the organization? Yes, thanks. So I'm a second generation, well, actually first on one side, a Caribbean American, grew up in the Bronx, and um, I found the, the stock market by age 16. So I guess I was lucky in a lot of ways. By 17, I was cold calling. By 18, I was in operations at Solomon Brothers, the Goldman of its day. This is, we're talking uh, 1990. And, uh, you know, I recall in my operations in the support function, lots of diversity, lots of everything, just color, gender, everything. But when I would sneak upstairs a few flights up to the trading floors, it was like a different planet. And so fast forward in my career, multiple firms, 20 some odd years in the front office as a trader, buy side, sell side, multiple continents, and the same story persists it just became apparent to me that, you know, something was amiss. And, you know, it didn't really come up that often. In my younger age, I was reluctant to speak to it. And if, if and whenever it did, it always seemed to be some kind of like secret code of like, we just can't find them. And I'm thinking to myself, I remember, um, you know, my neighborhood growing up, the congregation, kids in neighborhoods, smart kids all around me. I'm the eldest of five. All of us have degrees, sister double degrees psychology from Columbia. So this idea that other smart, talented young people of color did not exist is just, it never sat well with me. So fast forward, uh, I moved back from abroad two years ago and just was sure it was time to actually start doing something about it, to take this idea I had and say, how do we intentionally build bridges from communities like mine to this economic engine to, that the world has never known anything like it? the stock exchange and more broadly, economic opportunity, investments, et cetera. So you try to get inner city youth into the investment industry. So what do you think are the biggest roadblocks that are keeping them from you know, finding positions within the investment management? Um, you know, I would almost flip that question. And to some degree, it's awareness, you know, granted in our communities, even myself, you know, I didn't grow up with a father, a mother, an uncle, a cousin, anyone around me, a neighbor who were MDs, who ran desks, who played golf with MDs. So to some degree, it's incumbent upon organizations like mine, grassroots, uh, public education, et cetera, to um, bring more intentional awareness of these opportunities. But at the same time, you know, bear in mind, we're dealing with entrenched, how do we say, mechanisms and systems in terms of what Wall Street traditionally looks for, where they recruit, how they recruit. Um, and that conversation needs to really change. So, you know, so I guess it goes both ways, but I would say there is some onus, if not a large onus on the industry to rethink how they're recruiting um, the idea of inclusivity and diversity more broadly in general. It's one thing to invite a black or brown kid into uh, the team, into the firm. 
it's another thing where there aren't the support mechanism in place, for example, to retain that person. And so how do we build, if not, I would say a better phrase, change the culture from within. So it goes both sides, but largely it's about the culture and the, um, um, how do we keep Wall Street honest in that approach? All right, so, you know, obviously diversity is really high on the agenda for a C-suite, for the C-suite and in investment companies. So how do we get employers and in investment management to value this, you know, underserved part of the talent pool? Um, you know, I would say it's pretty straightforward, actually. You know, Wall Street, it, the beauty of Wall Street is the, being a performance-based culture. And so at the end of the day, um, Wall Street bound, our value add, our mission, it's less about the, the moral or diversity being the right thing per se, but the idea that diversity is actually good for business. You know, there is data, there are studies, everyone quotes McKinsey, um, the studies of the firms that have more diverse board of directors tend to outperform uh, those that do not. But at the end of the day, it's a performance-based culture. And the idea simply is let's train and give these people all they ask, all they want is the opportunity for seat at the table. Let's see how they do. And, you know, we all intuitively know there's smart kids everywhere, not limited by zip code. And let's keep it performance-based culture. And, you know, I think about, you know, 50, 60 years ago, black and brown people uh, could not even play professional sports in this country. And so let's just let the results uh, take us where they go. All right. So do you have any stories or examples of how you have been able to, you know, take some of these um, young people and get them positions within investment management? Oh, yeah. Where do I start? Um, a few interesting ones, I would say. So we launched last summer at a, a campus of CUNY, City University of New York, the largest public college system in America, in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, a largely West Indian neighborhood uh, that borders a largely uh, Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. And uh, one of our students, we plays soon thereafter, um, Andre. Andre was a customer care supervisor at NYU Dental for 10 years, customer service supervisor, NYU Dental School. And uh, let's see, he completed our boot camp last summer. Andre was a recent undergrad uh, a graduate in finance. And uh, I think within a matter of weeks after the first boot camp, we had him interviewing. And Andre now is a analyst at Wall Street Strategies, the well-known firm of uh, Charles Payne from Fox Business News. And um, we just, our last bootcamp ended August at St. Francis College in Brooklyn, sponsored by a large FinTech financial data firm called IHS Market. And bear in mind, the boot camps are just meant as introductions to a more intense, intensive training. But the students and employees are both finding value. And uh, we had Brenda. Brenda is a hungry young lady, uh, recent grad. Um, and so, yeah, there's stories out there. We have Alex, Paul, and Walder, uh, three young men who just started our, uh, the first cohort of the Diverse Trader Training Program, where they are training to become professional, uh, as we know, as we call them, prop traders. These are young men who we found through an application process, three, three essays, cognitive behavioral assessments, and now are on their way to managing real capital. So. Yeah, lots of stories. We get applications, just so you know, from as far as Africa, Saudi Arabia, Australia. It's, it's crazy, but, you know, a lot of um, stories out there, and we're just hoping to uh, scale and, and create more. All right. Well, we, you know, we did a study, that, our trust study that we do every two years, and one of the things we talk about is the, how, you, how professionals build trust and demonstrate value, and, and it's to build um, credibility and demonstrate professionalism. And on the credibility side, there's a lot about, you know, getting credentials. And I know that's one of the ways that you've been able to kind of, kind of move people into investment management by helping them get 
you know, some credentialing. So can you talk about that a little bit? Well, for sure, because again, at the end of the day, you know, going back to your previous question, you know, it, it's employers clearly have to uh, feel like there's an ROI on the investment in supporting us and any investments they make on their own in terms of uh, the pipeline. That's just standard business practice. And so to the degree that uh, the industry does have standard um, industry credentialing, you know, through our uh, self-regulatory body, FINRA, you know, by us focusing on building that as part of our programming, it, we have the, uh, it's two birds for one stone, if, if, if you will. It's the demonstration or mastery of certain, of certain knowledge, the basic technical knowledge, and at the same time, you now have, you're part of this club that you get these letters on your resume, and it's on your, it's a completely different conversation. That student applying from whatever school they may be, wherever they may be, you now have FINRA or CFA on that resume because you've done the investment foundations, because you've taken the SIE. That's a completely different conversation than that kid from whatever school, unless he's coming from Harvard, Ivy League, or HBCU. So absolutely, it's a critical part of this conversation in terms of clear, data-driven, objective demonstration of mastery and of achievement. And so that's a great point you bring up, and it's exactly why, let's say, the FINRA SIE the CFA Investment Foundation Certificate are a core part of what we're trying to uh, to deliver. Got it. So, as I said before, you know, large employers are looking, I mean, diversity is very high on their agenda. So, I'm wondering from your perspective, where do you think that, what do you think the current status of diversity in the industry is and how's the best way for firms to make needed change to their people model? Oh, boy, that's... That's a longer conversation. <laughs> um, what do I think it is? I think, you know, clearly this summer, we've had a broadening of, of the conversation broadly uh, across America, across the world. Um, we're having, I would say, not necessarily a change, but more off having more frequent conversations and certainly people being a, li- a, a bit more open-minded to having the deeper and the deeper conversations, but to the degree that the change really has to come from the industry, that, you know, the jury remains, you know, until let's say executive compensation is tied to hiring retention, you know, the alignment of the motivations, until that happens, you know, the jury's still out. You know, small things like blind resumes, um, if, you know, Tyrone from the Bronx, no matter how he gets the FINRA, the FINRA SIE, he has his CFA in, uh, in investment foundations, but he puts on his resume, Tyrone from the Bronx, you know, everyone has seen and read, um, what is it, Freakonomics. Uh, we all know the National Bureau of Economic Research, I think it was 1993, they did a study. Literally, are Emily and Greg more employable than Lakeisha and Jamal? Like, same resumes, change your names, uh, you think they got the same response rates? And let me scratch my head, but, you know, so until I think the industry in terms of its recruiting practices, but, you know, again, that's a deeper, longer conversation about inherent and uh, human biases, but to the degree that there are some core things that the industry can do, you know, I, I'm hopeful these conversations have begun, but, you know, what I can do is what I focus on in terms of more data-driven behavioral cognitive assessments, um, you know, that's data. That's what the industry claims to care about. Um, But, you know, we'll see. We'll see. But at least now we know that the conversations have begun and uh, that's hopeful. Yeah, but considering the dialogues that have been happening, uh, do you think the the industry is a little bit more open to it or at least trying to move in that direction? I mean, obviously there's a lot of work to be done, but... Um, Again, you know, I'm encouraged that um, the hard conversations have started. I'm encouraged that, you know, there's more, it's more in the lexicon, it's more in the public consciousness, but, um, you know, we've been here before. And so it is what it is. And what I can do, what I can focus on is the value we bring, our efforts, um, and that's, 
that's what I focus on. At the end of the day, it's these communities that, you know, it's, if you will, like the broader American society have had their eyes open, not our communities that have for years, decades, centuries been uh, affected by the wealth, income and wealth inequality, unequal un education opportunities, you know, incarceration, police, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the conversations are happening. Wall Street, for the most part, looks the same as it has for hundreds of years. That's just what it is. So what I focus on is, yes, there's a window of opportunity here. Yes, it took George Floyd to get us to really start having more of these conversations. And so with that, what I can do to bring intentionality to the efforts. All right, so another study that we did called the investment professional of the future, one of the things we talked about is now, you know, in, investments are done a lot more by teams than, mm. you know, than star portfolio managers as in the past. And one of the issues is to try to get people from diverse backgrounds, diverse educational backgrounds, diverse cultural backgrounds, experiential backgrounds, in order to reduce cognitive bias, right? So you'd think that investment management companies would be a lot more open to finding people from different walks of life. So what do employers do to find talent, you know, valuable talent in the, in, in the inner city? Uh, I could answer that very simply. Earnestly look for them. It's that simple. I mean, yeah, if you're recruiting talent from the same 13 schools, from the same team sports and fraternities, how do you expect to have any diversity of thought? You know, Ray Dalio speaks about it all the time. It's not just about color or gender. It's the difference in lived experience. Um, and so I would simply suggest go there themselves, go into where the talent is, you know, go visit a high school, a college in the South Bronx or call Wall Street Bound because that's exactly what we're about. You know, we intentionally are looking for the talent in these places because again, the premise is sound. Talent and IQ are universally distributed. And so with that in mind, we know that there's 5 million youth across the country, give or take, that are largely not connected to these opportunities. And so, you know, it's simple, just really look for it. But for the most part, you know, clearly Wall Street has proven its inability to do so on its own. So the other short answer is call Wall Street bound. Right. <laughs> so, you know, when you, I, I understand that one of the things you want to do is give um, students or, or give young people the technical background, the foundational investment skills that they're going to need, because that obviously makes them more credible, it makes them a more, more credible candidate for positions. But what else, what are the other skills um, are that you're recommending that they get um, for kind of the new way of working, right? So that they compete better for positions in the industry. Uh, you know, I get that. And, you know, to your point in terms of the more collaborative team um, investment, um, you know, it makes sense. Um, again, for the same reasons of avoiding you know, group think per se, but having more brains around the table, you know, people just recognize inherently it makes sense. And, you know, for example, that's one of the reasons why we've partnered with the Predictive Index, um, the same company used by uh, the folks at Bridgewater and elsewhere, bringing more trackable, data-driven, uh, intentional um, thinking to this idea of diversity. You know, at the end of the day, it's the, yes, on a certain topical level, diversity of gender, of race, but at the same time, you still want that diversity of, of thought. And that just comes down to behavioral analysis. And we, we are using the tools. Those tools have been out there. You know, I guess the more, not standard, but what's been used, the Myers-Briggs has been around since I think the 1930s. But how do we go beyond that? So, you know, to the degree that these young people have to be um, acclimated to a corporate environment, to a team collaborative environment. That's where mm -hmm. the term, I think, social uh, soft skills comes in. And that, at the end of the day, works in terms of bridging these two worlds where it's the combination of the social capital, the network, 
But once you're in that environment, how do you carry yourself? How do you speak? How do you handle adversity? How do you problem solve? And so, yeah, broadly speaking, as part of our equal uh, mandate as a workforce development nonprofit is that soft skills training, which, you know, is, is, is work that needs to be put in because these young people are not traditionally exposed nor coming from these environments. But with anything else, we know these young people have the cognitive capacity to learn. They're hungry. And it's just a matter of putting in the work and getting them in front of programs like ours that focus intentionally on that. And beyond that, I would say one thing I'm very sensitive to as a former trader is the internal work. Uh, no matter what we learn technically, how do you react under stress? And that comes in where I'd love to introduce gently the ideas of mindfulness, of, um, if you will, performance. And so that's something that I'm very intentional about um, that you probably don't get elsewhere, but how do you separate those two? How do you separate that full human being who takes the train from the Bronx to Wall Street? It's the same person, but how we handle things at home in the neighborhood certainly cannot be applied, much less going beyond that in those roles that are competitive, stressful, et cetera. How do we find that space internally to just um, quiet it, quiet ourselves? And I think that's part of the interesting journey of the full, full person from that, you know, literally the train ride from the Bronx to Wall Street, but that professional and human transformation. So long-winded way of saying on a certain level, soft skills training but more deeply, more internal, because um, you know it's a competitive, uh, it's a competitive world. But that's why we like it because it's performance driven. So how do we get? So how do you get them that training? Because I, I would assume that it's probably a little bit easier to get them the foundational um, understanding, the foundational skills, the technical skills, than the soft skills. For sure, for sure. Um, you know, a lot of it is the basic stuff. It's just them becoming aware of you know, repetitive muscles. Interviewing is just like working out. You know, you build that muscle. Um, the idea of practice, resume writing, interview skills. You know, some of these young people have never tied a tie before. You know, I remember being in high school and coming across some, I forget where it was. And I think I read there was like 90 different ways to tie a tie. I was blown away by that. Like, who <laughs> knew? Um, and so on a certain level, it's just the practice. How do you present? You know, our next boot camp starts uh, January 4th. We're going to have a presentation by a very genteel old Southern lady who's going to teach us and speak about manners and etiquette. You know, even in this world now, I was amazed that she was on top of it. Um, there is Zoom etiquette, and I'm probably breaking all the rules yeah, probably, right, right. <laughs> right now. <laughs> you know, suddenly everyone seems to have what, be avid readers and have bookshelves behind. You know, there is etiquette. And so... A lot of it, again, is just the exposure, getting them in front of it. Uh, the deeper stuff, I'm very, very excited to be announcing some things soon where we'll, we'll have, you know, professional performance coaches working with our students, with our cohorts. Ultimately, you know, I would love it to the point where each of our students had access to 30 minutes of a personal conversation with a professional to just let's work on getting them where they need to be. So there's multiple levels, but at the end of the day, it's just beginning that journey where they're becoming more aware of that inner conversation. So related to all that we've been talking about, what would you, how would you like to see the investment management industry evolve over the next five to 10 years? And what, what do you think they should focus on first? Um, again, I'll take it back to really having a, um, a, 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 a honest conversation of when they make these pronouncements, when they announce these lofty goals, 100,000 hires, a million hires, you know, what are we really trying to do as an industry? What are we really trying to do as a culture, as a society in terms of what does it mean um, to be open to diversity, uh, to be supportive once that talent is in the door, and then once they're in the door, how do they, how do they get upstairs? And so I think, you know, there's, there's work that needs to be done um, in terms of the real conversations of getting to the point where the industry is comfortable with different metrics. You know, if they want to stay mm -hmm. and, and recruit from the same 13 schools and the same uh, sports, which is fine, you know, I get it. I play tennis in high school. I play lacrosse in college. You know, I get it. You know, team sports are great. You learn things. I get it. But if we're going to have an honest conversation about broadening 
because we know at a very basic level, hunger, IQ is everywhere that we have to change that recruiting conversation. And that goes back to your earlier question. Well, you know, as I've heard it said out there, um, diversity is the one area of corporate America that leaders are allowed to fail. And so it starts with leadership, but to the degree again, that Wall Street Bound and myself as I, I gated and as I launched, you know, I'm looking forward to the future where, you know, with what I can do. Um, and so, yeah, I do see a Wall Street Bound FinTech lab in every public school in America, uh, Wall Street Bound curriculum in high schools across America, uh, Wall Street Bound alumni in all facets of not only just the finance industry, but corporate America. And ultimately, Wall Street Bound, you know, someone has to become a movement, if you will, if not the basis of a community investment platform, because, you know, I think the industry itself and access to industry in corporate America is really just beginning of the conversation of broadening the opportunity, the awareness for uh, careers, et cetera, for these communities in general. Um, you know, the income and wealth gaps will not go away on their own, but my background, my strengths, my passion is in finance, but really it's just beginning of that conversation. Great, so when, uh, so if these employers that are not, don't know where to find it, where's the best way, you know, to find good uh, inner city talent, where's the best way to, to get a hold of Wall Street Bound? Well, the simplest way is simply come visit us on our website. Uh, we have a contact form um, and certainly feel free to just reach out to us directly. Info at wallstreetbound.org. Info at wallstreetbound.org. Our team is expanding. Uh, I'm now very happy to say we've got a uh, recently joined a VP of Development and Partnerships, a program director that just started with, we'll, we'll start with us soon. And the team is growing and you can find us at our website, wallstreetbound.org. And certainly feel free to reach out to us directly, info at wallstreetbound.org and someone will get back to you very quickly, if not myself, because we are still a team of three, but I'm grateful because until a few weeks ago, it was a team of one. Oh, great stuff. So sadly, we have to leave it there. Troy, it's been a real pleasure talking to you and getting more information about the work you're doing at Wall Street Bound and the opportunities for any city youth to find jobs in the investment industry. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. And thank you for everything the uh, CFA Institute does. I mean, that uh, investment foundations program, I, I, I don't have to you know, yell it out to you, to you guys, but everywhere else I'm speaking about it because that is just a game changer uh, to get those three letters on the resumes of young people, wherever they may be, is absolute game changer that most of them don't recognize themselves. So thank you as well. And it's a pleasure. I look forward to uh, doing this again. Great. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider rating and reviewing us on iTunes or wherever you're listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts and it helps others find the show. Also, a quick reminder, this podcast isn't intended to provide expert advice on the topics we covered. If you need tax, accounting, or legal advice, please consult a professional. I am Lauren Foster. Thanks so much for listening.